Good morning, church. Good morning. It is so great to be here this morning. We, uh, we have one more party heard from. It's great to have George with us this morning. He has been... He has been pretty, uh, <laughs> pretty locked up in Tel Hai for uh, this last year, and and uh, it's great to see folks um, coming back, and uh, it's just good to connect again uh, with one another. Um, well, let's. I'll go to prayer requests in a little bit. Let's start with uh, Psalm ninety six. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord and praise his name. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Lord, we just invite you to this place. We know that you are here. You're always with us. But Lord, open our eyes and our hearts and our ears that we may um, hear from you, that we may just know your presence and your grace and your love with us. Bless each one who's here and each one who listens and watches uh, some other time. Um, let them know your grace and love for them. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. If you would, we're going to stand and sing uh, It Is Well. And this is one of my favorite hymns. And I, uh, I, I chose that background because of the story that goes behind it. If you don't know the story behind it, that the man who wrote this hymn had actually um, lost his family on a uh, in a storm they were on a ship they were traveling overseas and he asked when he followed them later on a ship that the captain would stop at the place where his family was lost and that's when he said he wrote this song so it is really a song that comes out of struggle and difficulty and yet he was able to still say it is well with my soul and so that is our our prayer and our hymn this morning Oh, this girl. 
seated. It's hard for me not to sing that at the very top of my lungs. Such a um, song of, of praise and worship. Um, I have um, a few uh, prayer requests and updates. Um, here we want to continue to pray for uh, little Macy, uh, Tina's seven-year-old granddaughter fighting cancer. Uh, this coming week she's got chemo Monday through Friday, and at this point she just has no immune system. Um, her numbers are low. They're, she's uh, praying. Hopefully she'll get back on track. I assume that's well, I'm not sure which numbers, but apparently the numbers that we want up. Um, also, Tina was clear to take her to, to her treatments one day a week, so that should help out um, the parents. Um, and, of course, anybody who's gone through stuff like this knows it's you know, not just a child, not even just the child and the parents, but the whole family has um, so much that they're, they're dealing with. So continue to pray for Macy and for, um, for her family. Um, and Emily is having a knee replacement um, on Wednesday, so be praying for her. She will take all the prayers that she <laughs> can get. She's nodding. Um, so, and we also have, um, this time I can say this on, uh, uh, on the tape because I know that he doesn't, uh, he's not able to get it. Roy Decker is going to be turning 90 on April 30th. And so we want to arrange some kind of a, either a, a drive-by uh, uh, visit, uh, you know, or something for him. And uh, Diane's officially in charge now. You can <laughs> talk to her. So how, we, uh, how we're going to meet um, whatever. So, but, and certainly, obviously, you can send a card to him. Um, and any other uh, prayer requests or things that you'd like to note? Yeah, Charlotte. I'm having cataract surgery tomorrow. Oh, okay. Charlotte's having cataract surgery tomorrow. Tomorrow. Anybody else? Is something that we want to? I just wanted to know how um, the Capus' family was doing. How is the Capus family doing? We had a couple request from Joe texted with my sister she's still it's a month in and she still feels horrible still no energy and my brother-in-law as far as I know is still in the hospital and they don't they just don't know what to do like you shouldn't fly if you have blood clots in your lungs and yeah it's not good yeah 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 um her sister is still still struggling not feeling great um brother-in-law um still uh, is not able to leave the, the hospital uh, from Vegas because he can't fly home because he's got blood clots in his lungs. So um, continue to pray uh, for them. Anybody else? Yeah, Bert. Uh, Ken and Anna's Anna's in the... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Anna's in the hospital. Yeah. The Zerbe uh, sisters. Yeah, we can keep praying for... Uh, for Anna and for Ken as well. Do you have any update or anything that you want to say? She moved to uh, like a higher level of higher care. Level of care. Okay, nursing care, maybe or yeah. Uh, Anna has been in a facility for a little bit now, several months since Thanksgiving, um, and she was moved uh, to a higher level of care, to nursing care. So um, pray for, for her and, and Ken and the family. So anybody else? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord Jesus, um, I give you thanks. I give you thanks for who you are. I thank, give you thanks for your presence in our lives. I give you thanks that like that hymn uh, testifies, we can say it is well with our souls even when things are in upheaval around us. Even when we're struggling, we can trust in you and know you're with us and cling to you and have hope. 
and encouragement. And Lord, I pray that for every person who has been mentioned here. Lord, we pray for uh, little Macy as she continues to go through these just such difficult uh, medical procedures. And Lord, I pray for her healing and her strength. And Lord, for her family, that you would lift them up and give them hope in, in the midst of all of this. Lord, we pray for for uh, Charlotte and for Emily as they have surgery this week, and we pray that all would go well with that and that you would give them peace and grace. May they have a, just an, an excellent result from, from both of these surgeries. Lord, we pray for uh, Tony's sister and, and brother-in-law that um, they're both... Uh, struggling with various health issues and, and especially the, the brother-in-law with clots. Lord, I, I just ask that, that you would bring healing, that you would strengthen, strengthen them. Lord, we pray for Anna and, um, and Lord, we, we ask that you would surround her with love and grace. I pray for Ken and for the whole family as well. And I know it's just so difficult to see someone who is so beloved and, and we know to be such a wonderful person and see her, um, her decline. And, and I just ask that you would this, just be close to them and bring them comfort and strength and peace in the midst of it all. Lord, we, we, uh, we give you thanks for Roy Decker and, and uh, his life and the celebration of 90, 90 years, his 90th birthday, and pray that we could just encourage him. I know he's just been so isolated during all of this, and uh, Lord, may we help him to remember he is, he is not forgotten, that he is loved and, and cared for. Lord, we pray that you would just bless our church and guide us, that you would um, just help us to know the best ways to be loving and serving you in our communities um, and uh, keep us faithful, make our hearts like yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Do you remember the wicked queen in Snow White who used to stand before her mirror and say, mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all? And she would wait for the mirror to tell her that she was the most beautiful in the land until it didn't. And instead, it told her that Snow White was now the fairest, which threw the queen into a jealous rage. And before the mirror could say, but second fairest is still really fair, she smashed it into a million pieces. Actually, I don't think she did do that, but... but <laughs> But who wants to be, she probably really wanted to, because who wants to be second fairest, especially once you've, when you've been the first fairest, right? <laughs> Being beautiful wasn't as important to the queen unless she was more beautiful than anybody else. It's an attitude of heart that's not as rare as we might hope. I think we probably all have some kind of mirror we gaze into and compare ourselves to others. Our mirror may not be about how we look. Maybe it's, uh, uh, maybe it's about athletics or it's about uh, how smart we, we are or um, whether we are best at our job or best students. We want the mirror to tell us we're the best of all, or at least that we're not the worst. At least we're better than somebody. If we can't convince ourselves we're the best, we can find solace in finding someone worse than us at the things that are important. In this morning's readings, Jesus' disciples have a question about greatness. 
They don't come out right and say, uh, they don't come out, they don't come right out and say it in this passage as they do in some other places. But the question was really, which one of us is the best disciple? I mean, we're the 12, we're better than everybody, but which of us is the best? Where do I stand in the lineup, Jesus? Tell me how great I am. And so Jesus chooses someone to represent the greatest in the kingdom. We're looking at Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 through 5. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he called a little child to them and placed the child among them. And he said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. In our day, it's pretty common to hear, uh, to hear people speak highly of the qualities of children. We recognize their ability to experience joy and wonder. Uh, we can be um, both frustrated and maybe a little jealous that time means so little to them, right? Um, they don't get so worried about what others think of them. We appreciate their honesty sometimes. Um, sometimes we think, yeah, maybe a little less, but I think some of the reason for uh, our appreciation of the values of children is that our society has been salted with these words of Jesus for 2,000 years. The disciples, I think, were just incredulous at Jesus' words. Elsewhere in the Gospels, we see the disciples shooing children away from Jesus, obviously seeing them as getting in the way of Jesus' much more valuable work. Certainly, they could see these children who flocked to him only as distractions and annoyances interfering with what was really important. And then Jesus takes this young child, and, and the word implies the child is fairly young, and says, you want to know what greatness is in God's kingdom? They probably had a list of the things they thought would make them great, the things they thought Jesus would be judging them on and, and uh, uh, they could compare themselves to. And he says, here's one who is truly great. He prefaces those words with, truly I say to you, we kind of think of that maybe as a throwaway phrase, but when you see that, it really is something he wants his disciples to pay particular attention to. Listen up, you guys. This is something I really want you to get. I think also, he's because he's saying something that is so foreign to them. Jesus demonstrates how different the values of the kingdom of God are from the values of the kingdom of earth. We value people with money and power, influence. Children have none of those things. But he pushes the point further by saying, not only is uh, the greatest in the kingdom like a child. He says, you can't even get into the kingdom unless you're like a child. Jesus makes it clear that becoming like a child would require a change for them. He says, unless you change and become like a child. Literally, it says, unless you turn. And I, and I kind of picture, you know, here they are kind of focused on uh, their own kind of ego and how great they are. And he's kind of saying, yeah, you need to, that's, that's just faced in the completely the wrong direction if you want to be great in the kingdom. But what exactly is it about a, a child that we need to imitate? Verse 4 literally says, unless you humble yourself like this child. The NIV translates it, whoever takes the lowly position of this child. And that certainly is a, a, a very significant part of it. 
again, children had no, they have no place in a sense. Um, they have no uh, political power, they have no legal standing, certainly in that world, in this world, much more so. But at that point, they really didn't. Um, not that they weren't loved, no doubt, but they weren't, they weren't respected in a the sense. They didn't have power or status. The disciples were always jockeying for position of who was the greatest. And Jesus is saying, as soon as you start doing that, you're heading in the wrong direction. The best possible example of someone who willingly took a lowly position is, of course, Jesus himself. The Christmas story reminds us that the God of the universe left a throne of glory to be born in the most humble of circumstances. The night before his death, he kneels before each of his disciples and washes their feet because each one of them thought they were too good for, for that job. In Philippians, Paul urges us to imitate Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. As adults, we're always trying to prove our worth, always trying to cover up our inadequacies and publicize our strengths. If you don't believe me, spend five minutes on Facebook <laughs> or almost any other social media page, right? How perfect everyone else's life can seem when it has been edited to show only the highest of highlights. They say that that is part of the um, increasing uh, rise, the rising levels of anxiety in youth. Uh, I read an article by researcher Joseph Davis from last year reflecting on, on these levels of anxiety. And he says we can trace some of that anxiety to what he calls soaring and absurd.